hard work, uh, honesty, uh, family values, uh, those are the important things. I was an only child, which of course meant I was sort of doted on by everybody. And uh, uh, it was post-World War II, so everyone was just happy to be alive and happy that things were doing well. So th that's why it was such a shock when my mother died that um, it just changed the world. My childhood up until age 10 was very good. Uh, um, again, we lived in a little village. Um, <clears throat> life was not that complicated. Um, uh, we went for uh, every year. I think we were lucky. We were working class, but this was the 1950s. And um, uh, at home, uh, there was three generations of us living in the same home. There was myself, my parents, and my mother's parents. And basically, my grandfather, my father, and my mother all went out to work. And my grandmother looked after house and helped bring me up. So I had one really nasty uh, experience in primary school. I ended up getting bullied by these couple of guys. I, I really don't know why they picked on me. I guess I was an easy target. And um, so the first thing that happened is my dad tried to teach me how to box. And uh, that was a complete failure. I just, there was no way I could, uh, I could box. So, of course, uh, then my, uh, my mother stepped in and marched me off to school, talked to the headmaster and put an end to the bullying. So that was a nasty experience. But most of the time, um, it was, that's the one nasty experience I can remember. My mother died when I was 10 years old. And my father remarried when I was 12. I wasn't very happy about that. Didn't like my stepmother. Don't think she liked me either. Such, such is life. But we lived in a small village, uh, a place called Bridge of Allen in Stirlingshire. A tiny little village, uh, 3,000 people maximum. And uh, like every village, everyone knows everyone else's business. People knew my mother really well. And I think my stepmother just wanted to get out of uh, uh, the local area. So she had relatives in, in Canada, Chilliwack, British Columbia, a place to avoid, I can tell you. Uh, and uh, so that's where we moved to. Basically, Scotland in the 1960s was a social democratic country. Uh, I, I did well in school. I passed my 11 plus exam, which is an exam they had in those days to separate the sheep from the goats, so to speak. They've, they've eliminated it now because it separated sheep from goats. Um, I was headed towards university, um, which would have been completely subsidized at the time. Um, moving to Canada, which was a capitalist country, still is, uh, I, we couldn't afford to send me to, to university. Um, so I had to find something else to do. I ended up working in a dead end job, Fraser Valley Frosted Foods. At that time, the Vietnam War was just starting and the uh, military was uh, advertising in Canada, come down and join. You'll get something called the GI Bill which is um, help you pay your way through university. So I hopped on the Greyhound bus, headed down to Everett, Washington, uh, signed up for the Marine Corps. And uh, a couple of months later, I was uh, heading down to San Diego, California for uh, uh, boot camp. Well, I spent my time in most of my time in something called civil affairs or civic action. Uh, the Americans uh, at that time didn't deal with foreigners very well and they really didn't connect with the Vietnamese people. Yet that was a major issue at the time. It was called winning the hearts and minds. That was a new term back in those days, by the way. 
so they had to win the hearts and the minds uh, of the Vietnamese people. And that meant people who like people like myself who would go out into the hamlets um, and the villages and meet with the villagers and, you know, basically sell uh, what we were doing. We would we would put on uh, medical uh, uh, programs. We would bring out a generator and show them movies. What we showed was propaganda films that were made specifically for the Vietnamese. In the, before I arrived, I, I spoke to people who, who had done this before I, I arrived, and they used to show um, standard American films until, trans, you know, with uh, uh, translated uh, for Vietnamese, um, until someone realized it was mostly a bunch of uh, cavalry killing Indians which uh, was a little too close to reality. So somebody high up in the hierarchy said, no more uh, Hollywood films. And we ended up having to show standard propaganda films that were made specifically for the, the, the people. Basically, uh, your government is good for you. These American people are nice. They're here. Uh, it was uh, propaganda. Um, if anything was destroyed by the American forces, uh, we would pay them off uh, for, for destroying their property. So basically interacted with the Vietnamese. I got the job because I was a foreigner to begin with, and uh, uh, I tended to get along with the Vietnamese a lot easier than a lot of the Americans who were sort of in shock about like, who are these strange people? You know? I love the Vietnamese. I love Vietnam, by the way. And was it traumatic? Yes, it was certainly traumatic. Um, saw a lot of uh, uh, bombs being dropped. Uh, saw napalm being dropped. Saw helicopter gunships just shooting up uh, uh, the countryside and. You know, we used to sit back and say, ah, we're watching the war. There's no TV, right? So we used to sit back and go, ah, we're watching the war. Um, you became quite callous, actually. One of the th things that people don't realize is that when you're in a, a dangerous situation, and that would be, in my case, it would be in the Vietnam War, you develop what is called black humor and we were always uh, despite being in a, a terrible situation by the way it wasn't terrible all the time as if uh, it was like m massive length of uh, boredom uh, and then suddenly all hell would break loose and you would be very scared petrified almost uh, and then it'd be back to boredom again for a long period of time. But the thing is, in a situation like that, you develop a really wicked sense of humor. I think it's a, it's a survival technique. So um, that to me was the time when uh, we told lots of uh, inappropriate jokes. We made lots of inappropriate comments, none of which I'm going to repeat here. Um, they'd all be considered racist and sexist today, but uh, uh, it's just the way it was. Three years, three months later, I got out, and uh, sure enough, um, I was subsidized all the way through university not enough to pay all my bills but certainly enough to make it a lot easier uh, through the gi bill beautiful dog yeah oh what a stunning one yeah what a stunning I'd always wanted, I mean, my entire plan was always to go to university. Uh, when I was in Scotland, <laughs> believe it or not, I was really good at math and physics, and I, was, I, I wanted to become a civil engineer. 
and um, after three years uh, in the military, two years in a dead end job in DC, uh, it's for some reason didn't really want to become an engineer anymore. Wanted something more spiritual. So I ended up taking a, a degree. My undergraduate degree was a joint major English Lit and uh, Cinema Studies. When I graduated with a BA with that, I suddenly realized um, no one's going to hire you with a degree like that. Certainly not in those days they didn't. Uh, so I went back and I took a master's and thank God the GI Bill kept coming. I took a master's in educational technology, which is basically a systemic way of looking at learning. And um, I've spent, I spent my whole career afterwards in training departments, first for Canadian National Railways and then for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, uh, developing training, delivering training. Here in Canada, uh, the fact you have to work for it, um, that's not bad too. I mean, so I know I got the GI Bill and that helped a tremendous amount, but I also had to work three part-time jobs to support myself. And uh, that builds character as well. And um, I remember those jobs and I learned a lot from them and uh, I learned uh, what I liked, what I didn't like uh, about work, and it, it inspired me to move forward. The, the, the jobs I had, uh, I was a waiter in this uh, horrible bar. <laughs> in fact, a couple of horrible bars, one on Crescent Street, one uh, near the old Forum. And uh, it was somewhat, what I learned from that is you need stability because it was, you lived on your tips, and if you got lots of tips, you, you did well. And if the weather was bad, uh, there was a snowstorm, then you didn't make any tips. And so I think that helped me to always look for some kind of stability. Uh, I worked in the audiovisual department at Concordia and I worked my way up to being a, a licensed projectionist. So I was showing the, the films for the uh, uh, the cinemat cinematographic art uh, uh, department, and uh, that was great. I got to see all sorts of classical films that uh, I wouldn't have probably seen otherwise. And finally, I ended up being a, a lecturer in the library studies uh, department at uh, Loyola campus at Concordia. And that was great because uh, that really pushed me out of my comfort zone because I really was not comfortable um, uh, for years and years talking in front of groups, public speaking. Um, and so that really pushed me to, to get out there and to uh, put, yourself, put myself out there and, and actually learn how to engage with an audience um, and how to deliver uh, training, which I used throughout my career. How, how would you say your relationship with your father was uh, growing up? When in my early, early years, uh, from as far back as I remember, till uh, probably till I was about uh, 11 years old, he was my hero. Um, I looked up to him. He had a very hard life. Um, uh, went through the war. Uh, he was Polish. Um, he was 18 years old when the war broke out. He was uh, during the Mil Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, if if you know what that is, which uh, basically set, uh, partitioned Poland. Um, he was in the eastern part. He was marched off to Siberia to um, detention camps, uh, forced labor, uh, and probably would have died out there until Hitler attacked the Soviet Union. And Stalin just had about these thousands of Poles who were out there, couldn't kill them all. So he shipped them down to Palestine and they formed the Polish Second Corps, uh, part of the British Eighth Army. So they did their training in Palestine. And then they uh, basically fought their way up through Italy 
uh, my dad was wounded in Italy, and after the war, they ended up they all ended up in Scotland, and um, they weren't about to go back to Poland, uh, which was now behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, so he had had a very very rough life, and I always looked up to him. He was my hero. And then uh, he basically uh, moved on to uh, another family. Uh, but at that time, I was uh, also growing. I was, became an adolescent, uh, left home, you know, moved on, made my own life. Um, it's actually my, my wife, uh, Suzanne, she... Uh, encouraged me to to get over whatever resentment I I have and to to reconnect um, with my dad and so um, I would be lying if I said there wasn't some ongoing resentment it's especially now when I think that um, I lost contact with a lot of my uh, Scottish uh, uh, relatives because immediately the only Scottish relatives that I know now, really know now are uh, from my stepmother. So I met my wife, Suzanne, in university, Sir George, Sir George Williams University, then became Concordia University. It must have been around about 1973, 74. Um, so, and we got married uh, in 1977. So we knew each other for a couple of years uh, before we got married. Um, I used to see her at the beginning of year every time uh, we met in a class and then after that we'd, I'd see her at the beginning of the year and say oh we got to get together for a coffee and then uh, of course we never did then next year we'd roll around oh hi how are you got to get together with a cup for a coffee so after a couple of years of that we actually did get together for a coffee and we spent uh, a couple of years together um, we uh, were uh, both uh, starting new jobs. Uh, we ended up getting married in 1977. Uh, she had graduated. I graduated with a bachelor's a year behind her. And um, so been together for almost 50 years now. So uh, we have two children, two boys. Um, we love them very much. Um, they have grown up and uh, they're making their lives on their own right now. And uh, um, we're always there as a support, uh, but uh, uh, yeah. In, in a brief few sentences, could you tell me what the meaning of life is? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, I don't think I can. The meaning of life, this, uh, another old cynic once said, uh, one of my old university professors said, the, the purpose of the game of life is to go on playing it. And even I'm not that cynical. Um, I think uh, the purpose of life is you end up here, not by your own choice, you just end up here randomly. And um, life hand, hands you a deck of cards, and you play with the cards you've got. And sometimes you've good cards, sometimes you've got lousy cards. Uh, sometimes you do well, sometimes you don't do so well. But really, you have to just you know, be as positive as you can and keep on going.